Uh, did you have a chance to read the sermon title? Does it say opportunity is nowhere? How many people think it says opportunity is nowhere? How many people read opportunity is now here? <laughs> Christopher All is the creator of this ambigram, and he used it in his book, Developing Ecological Consciousness. And he points out that if we see the world in a hopeless downward spiral, then opportunity is indeed nowhere. It would be silly to deny the challenges facing our congregation or to ignore the recent trends in the United Methodist Church as a whole but how quickly we emerge from our challenges depends on how many of us are able to see the possibilities. Are we able to break free from the way things have always been done to share God's healing and restoration in a new and creative way? Paul wanted to do just that. He felt convicted that he had been called by God to proclaim the stories of Jesus as far as he could, to as many people as he could, in many ways as he could, so that he could save some. And that drive is what had brought him to Corinth. Life was brutal in the dense urban areas. Crime and disease ran rapid and hunger and fire were a constant threat. Roman oppression caused the vast majority to live on that sharp edge of disaster. Paul believed that Caesar's reign and Christ's reign were going to come into conflict, and he wanted to save as many, to bring as many as he possibly could into the grace of God, including the Gentiles. Gentiles. He really wanted to change their perspective, to break through the class barriers and the religious differences and the walls that people had built around them from past behaviors. He wanted them to become one community united in God's love. He was teaching them new patterns of living based on the teachings, teachings of Jesus. The way that we interpret the world around us makes a difference in how we respond to the world. In her essay, To Love the Marigold, poet and playwright Susan Griffith tells this powerful story about Robert Desnos, a French poet imprisoned by the Nazis. We're going to join the story at the point where Desnos has been put on a transport to take him to the gas chambers. Along with many others who crowded the bed of the truck, Desnos is being taken away from the barracks of the concentration camp where he has been held prisoner. Leaving the barracks, the mood is somber. Everyone knows that the truck is headed for the gas chambers. And when the truck arrives, no one can speak at all. Even the guards fall silent. But this silence is suddenly interrupted by an energetic man who leaps off the truck and he grabs the hand of the man next to him and he says, I see you have a long lifeline and three children. He's using his imagination. First one man and then another offers up his hand for the pr prediction of longevity and more children and abundant joy. And as Desnos reads, palm after palm after palm, he changes the mood of the prisoners and the mood of the guards. Who can explain it? The element of surprise has planted a shadow in the doubt of the, pris of the guards' mind. If they had told themselves before that the death was inevitable of these men, it now no longer seems inarguable. They are, in any case, so disoriented by the change that has gone around them 
that they are unable to execute these prisoners and they put them back on the truck and take them back to the camp. Desnos has saved his own life and the life of others by using his imagination. Robert Desnos was a famous for his belief in imagination. He believed it could transform society. And what a wild leap it was at the mouth of the gas chambers to imagine a long life. In his mind, he simply stepped out of the box of life created by the SS. He saved many lives that day by his ability to step out of the existing boundaries, and yet eventually the concentration camps took their toll, and he died just weeks after the camp was liberated from typhus. But what is most striking about the story is that Desnos didn't imagine retaliation against his enemy. He imagined freedom and life for all. It, what, it was what he stood for, liberation and life, that saved all of them. We can learn from the apostles Paul and the poet Desnos visionary behavior to look for opportunity among our challenges and to look for the resources that God is going to send and maybe to squint more a little to see God's more hopeful and life-giving vision clearly. I've been hearing a funeral dirge over the past several months that sounds like this. Our children have left the congregation. We don't have any young people in worship anymore. I, too, mourn the families that have left. But I look at Jeffrey and Kirsten and at Trey. I see Gracie, Tyler, and Jeremy quite often. I welcome when Megan and Molly come to church. And in them, I see the seeds of new beginnings. I see the possibilities. So this week, we had our first youth event, and it was awesome. The children got, came, and they heard the facts and fables behind Valentine's, the real Saint Valentine's, and the Hallmark Valentine's Day. And they made chocolates for themselves, but also for the whole congregation, especially for the people who can't be here. And the question of the night was this. When can we do this again? When can we do this again? Our youth wanted to learn more about God. Our youth wanted to serve like Christ. Our youth wanted to have that feel of the Holy Spirit when they gathered. That's new possibilities. Amen? Amen. Paul didn't promise that following God's plan <coughs> would be easy. In fact, he said it would take self-control and endurance. Listen again to the scriptures, this time from Eugene Peterson's translation called The Message. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs. One wins. Run to win. All the good athletes train hard. They do it for the gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that is gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping. Telling everybody else all about it and then missing out myself. When athletes run, they are focused on one goal, crossing that finish line. They're willing to sweat, to endure the ache of their muscles, 
to push themselves harder and harder and faster and faster until feet pounding and fists pumping, they cross that finish line. When football players line up like they did last Sunday and they count down and run into position and move the ball down the line, they have a game plan in mind. Hours of drills and running plays repeatedly have prepared them to win. So when the quarterback actually throws the ball, he can envision the other player catching the ball. Against all odds, the whole team is preparing to win. They can see it. They can hear it. They can even taste victory. What would it look like? If our congregation prepared for a divine game plan like that, men and women would be willing to give up a Saturday to go and train to become stronger leaders so that our congregation could move forward boldly, counting on the secure foundation that had already been built within. We would continue to mentor our young people and those who are young in faith, helping them to grow from that first childlike understanding of Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, into a relationship with God in which they knew they were loved and wanted and expected to be a force for good will in our world. People would come to worship expecting to find the Holy Spirit here and they'd be so excited they would invite their friends and family and they too would be healed and refreshed and transformed into powerful <coughs> athletes for God ready to run that race. Members and guests would hunger for that deeper discipleship with Christ, and they would seek not only good spaghetti dinners, which are very good, and nurture and fellowship, but also the life-giving word. Can you see that too? Can you see the vision of this congregation healthy and strong and being a driving force transforming the community around us, making it a better place? I do. I've looked out. It's like I've looked in the, to the palm of our communal hand and seen a long lifeline and many offspring. The season of Lent is almost here. On Tuesday, February 21st, we're going to gather and we're going to celebrate and we're going to rid our houses of fat and we're going to, in preparation, to walk more closely with Christ. And we're going to eat sausage and pancakes until our tummies and our hearts are full of friendship and love. And then on Ash Wednesday, we're going to begin a journey to home. <coughs> and I invite all of you to take this Lenten journey with us as we travel with Jesus to the cross and discover the hope that can be found in the midst of life's difficult circumstances. I dare you to trek with our youth on Monday nights or with our adults on Wednesday nights <coughs> or to do something right outside of the walls and show up for lunch with the ecumenical group on Wednesdays. <coughs> If we open ourselves to this new vision, if you can see Delmont as strong and healthy, then on Easter we will be able to celebrate a baptism or a true renewal of our own baptisms and bring a new member into our church. And we will not only be able to celebrate the risen Lord on that day, we will also have been midwives to new birth or exciting rebirth. 
we will have worked with God to transform the lives of others. Our future is awesome. It's going to take work and sweat, and the Spirit is going to work, walk with us, but I know we can do it. Amen.